As spring approached, the sodders, as they said they would, planted flowers in the soil, bulldozed over the house. Jenny tended carefully for the rest of her life. However, further developments in early 1946 reinforced the family's belief that the children they were memorializing might, in fact, be alive somewhere. Evidence emerged which supported their belief that the fire had not started in the electrical fault and was instead set deliberately. The driver of a bus that passed through Fayetteville late Christmas Eve said he had seen some people throwing balls of fire at the house. A few months later, when the snow had melted, Sylvia found a small, hard, dark green rubber ball-like object in the brush nearby. George, recalling his wife's account of a loud thump on the roof before the fire, said it looked like a pineapple bomb, hand grenade, or some other incendiary device used in combat. The family later claimed that contrary to the fire marshal's conclusion, the fire that had started on the roof, although by then there was no way to prove it. Other witnesses claimed to have seen the children themselves, one woman who'd been watching the fire from the road said she'd seen some of them peering out of a passing car while the house was burning. Another woman at a rest stop between Fayetteville and Charleston said she served them breakfast the next morning and noted the presence of a car with Florida license plates in the rest stop's parking lot as well. The Sodders hired a private investigator named C.C. Tinsley from the nearby town of Golly Bridge to look into the case. Tinsley learned that the insurance salesman who had threatened them with a fire a year before over George's anti-Mussolini sentiments had been on the coroner's jury that ruled the fire an accident and told this to the Sodders. Tinsley also learned of rumors around Fayetteville that despite the fire marshal's report to the Sodders that no remains had been found in the ashes, Morris found a heart which he later packed into a metal box and secretly buried. Morris had apparently confessed this to a local minister who confirmed it to George. George and Tinsley went to Morris and confronted him with this news. Morris agreed to show the two where he had buried the metal box and they dug it up. They took what they found inside the box to a local funeral director, who after examining it, told them it was in reality fresh beef liver that had never been exposed to fire. Later, more rumors circulated around Fayetteville that Morris had afterwards admitted the box with the liver had indeed not come from the fire originally. He had supposedly placed it there in the hope that the Sodders would find it and be satisfied that the missing children had indeed died in the fire. In 1949, there was an excavation. George did not wait for reports of sightings to come in. Sometimes he made them himself. After seeing a girl in a magazine picture of young ballet dancers in New York City who looked like one of the missing daughters, Betty, he drove all the way to the girl's school where his repeated demands to see the girl himself were refused. He also tried to interest the FBI in investigating what he considered a kidnapping. Director J. Edgar Hoover himself, who personally responded to his letters, saying, Although I would like to be of service, he wrote, the matter related appears to be of local character and does not come within the investigative jurisdiction of this bureau. If the local authorities requested the bureau's assistance, he added, he would of course direct agents to assist, but the Fayetteville Police and Fire Departments declined to do so. Then, in August 1949, George was able to persuade Oscar Hunter, a Washington, D.C. pathologist, to supervise a new search through the dirt at the Sodders House site. After a very thorough search, artifacts, including a dictionary that had belonged to the children and some coins, were found, and several small bone fragments were unearthed, determined to have been human vertebrae. The bone fragments were sent to Marshall T. Newman, a specialist at the Smithsonian Institution. They were confirmed to be lumbar vertebrae, all from the same person. 
Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death should have been around 16 to 17 years old, according to Newman's report, and the top limit of age should have been around 22 since the centra, which normally fuses at 23, are still unfused. Hmm. So, given this age range, it wasn't very likely that these bones were from any of the five missing children, since the oldest, Maurice, had been 14 at the time, although the report allowed that the vertebrae of a boy his age sometimes were advanced enough to appear to be at the lower end of this range. Newman added that the bone showed no sign of exposure to flame, Further, he agreed that it was very strange that those bones were the only ones found, since a wood fire of such short duration should have left full skeletons of all of the children behind. The report concluded that the vertebrae had, instead, most likely come from the dirt that George had bulldozed over the site. Later, Tinsley supposedly confirmed that the bone fragments had come from a cemetery in nearby Mount Hope, but could not explain why they had been taken from there or how they came to be at the fire site. The Smithsonian returned the bone fragments to George in September of 1949. According to its records, their location is still unknown. The investigation and its findings attracted national attention, and the West Virginia legislature held two hearings on the case in 1950. Afterwards, however, Governor Oki L. Patterson and State Police Superintendent W. E. Burchett told the Sodders that the case was hopeless and closed it at the state level. Now, the FBI decided it had jurisdiction as a possible interstate kidnapping but dropped the case after two years of following fruitless ends. Continuing the family's investigation With the end of official efforts to resolve the case, the Sodders did not give up hope. They had flyers printed up with pictures of the children, offering a $5,000 reward, which was soon doubled, for information that would have settled the case for even one of them. In 1952, they put up a billboard at the site of the house and another along U.S. Route 60 near Anstead with the same information. It would in time become a landmark for traffic through Fayetteville on U.S. Route 19, which is today's State Route 16. The family's efforts soon brought another reported sighting of the children after the fire. Ida Crutchfield a woman who ran a Charleston hotel, claimed to have seen the children approximately a week afterwards. She said, I do not remember the exact date, but in a statement she claimed, the children had come in around midnight with two men and two women, all of whom appeared to her to be of Italian extraction. When she attempted to speak with the children, one of the men looked at me in a hostile manner. He turned around and began talking rapidly in Italian. Immediately, the whole party stopped talking to me. She recalled that they left the hotel early the next morning. Investigators today do not, however, consider her story credible, as she had only first seen photos of the children two years after the fire, five years before she came forward. While George followed up leads in person, traveling to the areas from where the tips had come, a woman from St. Louis, Missouri claimed Martha was being held at a convent there. A bar patron in Texas claimed to have overheard two other people making incriminating statements about a fire that happened on Christmas Eve in West Virginia some years before. None of those proved significant. When George heard later that a relative of Jenny's in Florida had children that looked similar to his, the relative had to prove the children were his own before George was satisfied. In 1967, George went to the Houston area to investigate another tip. A woman there had written to the family saying that Lewis had revealed his true identity to her one night after having too much to drink. 
She believed that he and Maurice were both living in Texas somewhere. However, George and his son-in-law, Grover Paxton, were unable to speak with her. Police there were able to help them find the two men she had indicated, but they had denied being the missing sons. Paxton said years later that doubts about that denial lingered in George's mind for the rest of his life. Another letter that they received that year brought the Sauters what they believed was the most credible evidence that at least Lewis was still alive. One day, Jenny found in the mail a letter addressed to her, postmarked in Central City, Kentucky, with no return address. Inside was a picture of a young man of around 30, with features strongly resembling Lewis's, who would have been in his 30s by now if he had survived. On the back was written, Lewis Sauter, I love brother Frankie. The family hired another private detective to go to Central City and look into the case, but he never reported back to the Sodders, and they were unable to locate him afterwards. Nonetheless, the picture gave them hope. They added it to the billboard, leaving Central City out of it and any other published information, out of fear that Lewis might come to harm and put an enlargement over it at their fireplace. George admitted to the Charleston Gazette Mail late the next year that the lack of information he'd been searching for was like hitting a rock wall, saying, we can't go any further. But nevertheless, he vowed to continue. Time is running out for us, he admitted in another interview around that time. But we only want to know if they did die in the fire, we want to be convinced. Otherwise, we want to know what happened to them. George Sauter died in 1969. Jenny and her surviving children, except John, who never talked about the night of the fire except to say that the family should accept it and get on with their lives, continued to seek answers to their questions about the missing children's fate. After George's death, Jenny stayed in the family house, putting up fencing around it and adding additional rooms. For the rest of her life, she wore black in mourning and tended the garden at the site of the former house. After her death in 1989, the family finally took the weathered, worn billboard down. The surviving Sauter children, joined by their own children, continued to publicize the case and investigate leads. They, along with older Fayetteville residents, have theorized that the Sicilian Mafia was trying to extort money from George, and the children may have been taken by someone who knew about the planned arson and said they would be safe if they left the house. They were possibly taken back to Italy. If the children had survived all those years and were aware that their parents and siblings had survived too, the family believes they may have avoided contact in order to keep them from harm. Sylvia Sauter Paxton, the youngest in the family, died in 2021. She was in the house on the night of the fire, which she said was her earliest memory. I was the last one of the kids to leave home, she recalled to the Gazette Mail in 2013. She and her father often stayed up late talking about what might have happened. I experienced their grief for a long time. She believed that her siblings survived that night and assisted with efforts to find them and publicize the case. Her daughter said in 2006, she promised my grandparents she wouldn't let the story die, that she would do everything she could to find answers. In the 21st century, these efforts have come to include online forums like websleuths.com in addition to media coverage. The increase in the latter has led some who have examined the case to believe that the children did in fact die in 1945. George Bragg, a local author who wrote about the case in his 2012 book, West Virginia's Unsolved Murders, believes that John was telling the truth in his original account when he said he tried to physically awaken his siblings before fleeing the house. He allows that the conclusion may still not be correct, 
Logic tells you they probably did burn up in the fire, but you can't always go by logic. Stacy Horn, who did a segment on the case for National Public Radio around its 60th anniversary in 2005, also believes the children's death in the fire is the most plausible solution. In a contemporaneous post on her blog, with material she had cut from her story for time, she noted that the fire had continued to smolder all night after the house collapsed, and that two hours was not enough time to search through the ash thoroughly. Even if it had been, the firefighters may not have known what to look for. However, she said there is enough guideline weirdness about this whole thing that if some day it's learned that the children did not die in the fire, I wouldn't be shocked. I'm John Driscoll. Thank you for joining me. Until next time, God bless. Be safe.